Um, I'd like to ask you to join me in silencing your phone. And if you need the sound to be increased, just wave your hand and someone in the sound room will pay attention and increase the volume. Thank you. Uh, the bathrooms can be found after you leave the earth room. Go left and the bathrooms will be on your right. Uh, we invite you to become a friend of the Mammoth Center for World Religions and Ethical Thought. Please complete our very simple application and all that will do would be put you on a mailing list to receive announcements of future events. Lots of other resources are available at our literature table, which is in the community room. Yesterday was a very exciting day. Mosaic 7 started with over 55 students. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful And uh, Mosaic stands for mobilizing our students for action to build interfaith community. It's really our teenage program when we get together at each other's houses of worship and learn about other faiths. Uh, the other big part of that is the community action work we do together. Lots more information is on our website and also on the GardenStateMosaic.org website. Join us. Sunday, November 24th, 4 p.m., for our annual United We Sing. It's a time when we get together in interfaith celebration of gratitude. I'd like you to uh, thank the sound people, Rich Hell, and also Harrison Toll, who is doing the videotaping today. Greatly, greatly appreciated. We have re recently been officially accepted by the United Religions Initiative as one of their cooperation circles. In so doing, the Mammoth Center has joined a global multi-faith multi community, greatly expanding our reach. We have a basket in the community room and appreciate your donations to help defray the costs of of this program. I would like to invite the board members of the Mama Center to stand so they can be recognized. And you can. <laughs> this is a working group. Hey, the, all the work and setting up programs and the planning and the organizing is done by these wonderful, wonderful people. Now today, we are delighted to have David Blankenhorn with us. Um, later, Joe Ritaka, our program chair and most capable Shanti program team leader, will introduce him. We are using the Better Angels model in our civil discourse project, and we have created the Central Mammoth Better Angels Alliance, where a group of folks who are on opposite sides of the political divide are becoming familiar with each other and dialogue about subjects of their choosing. The polarized mind is thought to be one which is fixed on one point of view to the utter exclusion of competing points of view. And it is killing us and has been for millennia, according to author Kirk Schneider. He attributes this in roots of feeling insignificant helpless and groundless. This is, arises from personal and collective trauma, ignorance, or fear. Lots more information will happen this afternoon, and we're going to have a time for questions and answers following the talk. And then everyone is invited to join us in the community room for refreshments after the session. We are very grateful for the endowment from the Chada family, and some of the members are just arriving and welcome. So happy you're here and you've made it. That, this has made the Shanti Lecture possible for these 20 years, and we're most appreciative. 
It was initiated by Roshan and Ellen, and also by John Ham Sabash, who just came in, with this dedicated fund in honor of their parents, Sui Ram and Shanti Chada. The main purpose of the lecture is to provide greater information about South, South Asian religions and other lesser known religions and emphasize we have broadened the focus to include advancement of peace and religious freedom. Today will be about civil conversation and bridging the divides that separate us. Now, Roshan and Ellen were unable to be here. Roshan is doing very well post hoc from a knee replacement. Um, but their son, Aram, is here, and uh, other members of the family. And so I'd like you to join us in welcoming the family of Sui Ram and Shanti Chai. My name is Arun, I'm a Roshan and Ellen's son. Uh, we from the Chana family welcome you all to the 20th Shanti Lecture, named after our grandmother and great-grandmother. We are especially pleased to welcome you on this occasion, the 150th birthday celebration of Mahatma Gandhi, an apostle of peace in our time. Hello, good afternoon. I am um, Kelly, and uh, I am a woman's wife. Um, we, as Americans, cherish the freedom and right to disagree, which we do, often deeply important issues that need resolution. But polarization undermines that freedom by tightening prejudices rather than opening thought, thus dis dis diminishing the chances for finding resolutions and moving forward. <coughs> So while polarization may feel like a righteous champion of freedom and right, it is in fact just the opposite. A stick jammed in the spokes of the democratic discourse of freedom. Here are some of the common ways it does this. Better Angels is a national citizens movement to reduce political polarization in the United States by bringing liberals and conservatives together to understand each other beyond stereotypes, forming red-blue community alliances, teaching practical skills for communicating across political differences and making a strong public argument for depolarization. We unite red and blue Americans in a working alliance to depolarize America. Instead of asking people to change their minds about key issues, we give all Americans a chance to better understand each other, to absorb the values and experiences that inform our political philosophies, and to ultimately recognize our common humanity. If feelings about political opponents can be represented on a spectrum, our objective is to move Americans from hatred to respect and appreciation. Our approach is guided by the Better Angels Pledge. As individuals, we try to understand the other side's point of view, even if we don't agree with it. In our communities, we engage those we disagree with, looking for common ground and ways to work together. In politics, we support principles that bring us together rather than divide us. Better Angels, the proper place of empathy in political life and the importance of depolarization to preserving the possibility for political progress in the long run. <laughs>
Can you hear me okay? First, I want to address the question that people have asked me is, why is the Monmouth Center, an interfaith organization, getting involved in politics? Um, the background is at an annual retreat where we focus on our priorities for the next year or so. We were all very concerned about the growing divisiveness in our country. We said, we dialogue about what we might do about that. After deep, thinking deeply about this, it became clear to some of us that the issues of interfaith strife are very similar to the issues of political strife. Basically, you have, they're both their ideologies in both cases, and the, and the problem of divisiveness is often caused by zealots on both sides who fan up the differences, tell mistruths, and tend to move us apart. So since we use the dialogue to bridge the gap between the religions, we have learned that people have gotten to like and respect each other once they've gotten to know each other. So we decided, say, why don't we apply our experiences and skills with dialogue across the interfaith divide to go across the political religious divide. So we decided to do that. Then we said, okay, how are we gonna do this? We envisioned bringing a bunch of people together and having something not quite go right. Um, this is not unusual. So we looked around and said, I wonder if anybody else has kind of figured this out. We kind of know how to do dialogue if it, if it doesn't start with hostility. So then we discovered the Better Angels had an approach that is really working. Um, they were formed, I guess, after the last election, motivated by the fact that there was growing divisiveness in this country and they wanted to do something about it. Um, they've been set up from the beginning with a balance of people on the left and the right, so there's not a one side trying to dominate the other side, and it's worked. Uh, last time I looked, and David may correct, correct me later, there are about 7,000 dues-paying members of Better Angels at this point. It's growing leaps and bounds, and they've run close to about 1,000 training workshops. It's not easy to dialogue on stuff that you feel strongly about. So you need to learn some tricks, and it doesn't come with just one lecture. It comes through practice. And beyond practice, it comes through, as you say something that maybe isn't quite right, but you're in a room of people that you trust and have get to know and respect. Hopefully they will cut you some slack and turn it into a teaching moment as opposed to hitting you over the head. So the Better Angels model has been doing that. We've been, we formed a local alliance in June of this year with seven blues and seven reds. That's Better Angels lingo. Um, for people conservative or liberal, and we've had five meetings, and we've had five meetings, five experiences with civil dialogue across the divide. So difficult though it may be, it can be done. I'll also add that some people, when I told them what I was doing, they said, Joe, you're crazy. Good luck, etc. okay? So ultimately, I finally came up with a response. I believe this is an old Chinese proverb. Better to light a candle in the dark than to curse the night. So that's, we're doing our little part. And the other thing it actually does for those of us who are participating, if you're participating, it helps alleviate your own personal cynicism and apathy because you're actually trying to do something. So it's actually a good, I'll call it a good self-help tonic so you don't just kind of get angry. Turn your anger into positive action. I guess that's where that goes. So why the term better angels? And I apologize if I am redundant to David, but the, it's, it's good to be redundant when you're saying something good, so I don't worry about that. Uh, better angels comes from Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address, as the country was really splitting and 
actually led to war. He declared, we are not enemies. Furthermore, he called us all to be touched by the better angels of our nature. So we have to dig down for the good stuff in us, not be stoked by those who want to divide us. And as you heard earlier from the Chada family, which I appreciate, uh, the mission of Better Angels is not to convince anybody to change their mind, but rather to try to understand each other's point of view so that, and look for things that can bring us together as opposed to divide us. I got an email today from Better Angels to give you a sense for what they're all about. As a snippet, our constitutional republic was made to, with, to withstand disagreement. It is, in a sense, the fuel of democracy. If everybody thinks one way, it's not going to work. You need, you need diversity to come up with solutions that help everybody. Uh, many disagreements make us question the motivations and characters of our neighbors. If you have felt this way lately, even about the people you love, it is understandable. You are not alone. Yet our nation is only as strong as our willingness to understand the humanity in our fellow Americans' point of view, even if we disagree with it strongly. So I'd like the members of the local Central Monmouth Alliance to stand. There should be up to 14 of us, plus, I guess, so some people have red, and some people have blue, and some people have uh, neutral color. Those are the organized, neutral organizers that have helped pull this together. So I guess we have a handful of this here. There are, there are about 50 alliances around the country. I think that there are two more in New Jersey, one in Belmar and one in Summit. Do we have any representatives? Welcome. Summit, Belmar? Summit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and if there are other members of the Better Angels Alliance, uh, please stand. I believe there's 200 plus in New Jersey. We did invite you all, so, okay. Yeah. Um, hopefully after today we'll have a few more. <coughs> You'll get, we'll, we'll invite you. Uh, we have invited some government officials, as we especially want them to get with the program of civil discourse. So if, there, if you are a local official and you want to be recognized, you may stand, but I would ask you to just say your name, where you, what town you're from, and if you care, you can mention your affiliation, but no speeches, please. If you want to talk to folks, they can engage you after during the meal. Anyone? No. We, keep, we keep trying. We, we will keep trying. So it's no surprise that this year's Shanti lecture, rather than focus on basically religion, we decided to focus on the political religion divisiveness as a way to deal with the political divide. So ideally, so let's see if we can find somebody from Better Angels logical place to start. We asked. We were most fortunate not only to get a yes, but we got a willingness on part of its co-founder and president to be our Shanti lecturer. So exceeded our expectations. Sometimes when you try to do good, good things happen. And some of us know this. When we formed Mosaic, we had any number of obstacles. They just melted away. God was with us if you believe in God, or luck was with us if you don't. <laughs> so David Blankenhorn submitted to me a very humble mini-bio, uh, but briefly before co-founding Better Angels, he led the Institute for American Values, a think tank on civil society. He grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, graduated from Harvard, received an MA in history from the University of Warwick in England, and now lives in New York City. So he has been around. From a recent article, I learned that David has traversed the political aisle several times. Don't know exactly what that means, but I have a clue. Uh, the article further says, um, he has the rare distinction of managing to lose friends on both sides of the aisle. <laughs> so, I suspect that all that experience motivated him big time to start Better Angels. 
David? He's nodding. Okay. So I'll use one of David's quotes to help frame his perspective. We Americans didn't necessarily think our way into political polarization, but we're likely going to have to think our way out of it. So David, please help us to think better, talk better, and to act better. Thank you, family, for all the good work you're doing. Good afternoon. So I'm going to ask uh, three questions and then discuss them with you. The first question is, what's the nature of our crisis today? What are its qualities and uh, conditions? The second is, what kind of country do we want to be? Which is another way of saying, who are we as a people? And the third question is, what can we do in 2020 for a better America? These are three simple questions. Easy answers, we'll be able to solve them together in a few minutes and then go have refreshments. <laughs> so what is the nature of our crisis today? One way to think about it is to say that it centers upon President Trump. You could say, if you're on the left, you could say, well, this is an aberrant president. This is... Uh, Something that poses an existential threat to our basic institutions and values. And therefore, the real nature of our crisis in 2020 is to make sure that he does not continue as our president. That's it. That's the fight. That's where we need to suit up and show up and make our voice heard. And if you're on the right, you could say, that, well, uh, instead of being a, sorry, we're okay? All right, instead of being an existential threat, uh, President Trump is really an existential opportunity. A chance, perhaps our last chance, I think I'm gonna just take it off. So, well, no, we need to have you record for people who can't hear. Yeah, but I don't want to spend an hour having it bump, bump, bump. No, I'm just, I'm just not liking the constant interruptions. Yeah, let's try that. It was the Russians. <laughs> no, it was the Ukrainians! <laughs> One, so, the, if you're on the conservative side of things, one way you could think of the crisis of our day as centering on President Trump is that he represents an existential opportunity to say something important about the country, not to lose the essential nature that we, what, what we love about the country. You know, Glenn Beck the other day, a conservative commentator, I have a lot of respect for him, he said that if President Trump loses in 2020, America as we know it will cease to exist. And I don't know, I think people said that on the right last time too. I don't think he said it, but I know Rush Limbaugh and others said it. That if uh, President Trump does not prevail, an existential threat will exist. I think it would do well for conservatives to believe that when liberals say that we're facing an existential threat, they are sincere about it. They're not making this up for effect, and I think it would be due well for liberals to believe the same thing of conservatives, that they're sincere when they say they believe that this is the nature of the situation. So that's one way to look at it. <clears throat> what is our challenge? Another way to look at it, just the way I look at it, is that the problem doesn't center upon President Trump, the problem centers upon us. 
the American people. And that what has happened is that we have lost our trust in one another as fellow citizens. We've lost the quality of civic friendship that a democracy depends upon. And uh, so what has happened, the beautiful statements that you all made about polarization, uh, that, you know, what we're talking about here is what scholars call affective polarization, having to do with our feelings toward one another. So it's not only do I disagree with you politically, but I believe that you're some kind of alien, some kind of threat in some larger sense, that your views are so misguided that, what are you, delusional? How could anybody possibly think this way who is a person of goodwill? So it's not just that you're wrong, you're a danger. This is some weird thing that is incomprehensible to rational people. This, this other, otherness of the other side. And when each side believes that about the other, and I can tell you they do, uh, our, our democracy is in some trouble. James Madison said, one of the founders, he said that, a republic depends upon a higher degree of virtue in the citizens than any other form of government, right? If we're under some authoritarian uh, ruler, we are just sheep, we're just told what to do. And we, we're, we're sheared whenever the guy says shear us and so forth. But in a democracy, in a republic, we are expected to carry around a piece of the ruler inside us and to be responsible to one another that's what Madison called virtue, this sense of that in a free society where we govern ourselves, we are also obligated to care for each other, or else the whole enterprise, uh, the whole enterprise can grind to a halt. And so in this understanding of what is the crisis, the Trump presidency is less a cause of what ails us than a consequence. And from the conservative point of view, whoever the Democrats nominate that pose an existential threat will end America as we know it. That is more a consequence than a cause of the crisis. Okay, so, so I'm arguing to you that, that um, as valid as it is for all of us to, to uh, suit up, in 2020 and hope that our candidate wins 50% plus one or thereabouts. As important as that is, winning that victory will not give us the kind of country we want. If your side wins with 50% plus one or two, that will be a day for important celebration. Pop open the champagne because important things will happen for the country that would not have happened had your candidate not won. Okay, I understand that part. But you will not get the country that you want. You will not get it. So what is the kind of country we want? What is, what is the kind of country we want? Well, I think the answer is clear enough if we look to some of the beautiful words and sacred words even from our history and tradition, words that have been repeated over and over again since the founding, words that we're all very familiar with, they have been said many times and in many different ways, and it tells us the kind of country that we can be. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Liberty and justice for all. Let freedom reign. America, America, my God, may God thy goal refine till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. This land is your land. Oh, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Now, when Langston Hughes wrote those last words, 
in 1944 in a hotel room in New York City, doesn't it feel like he was capturing this idea of America about as beautifully as it can be captured? It's like this is the, this is the promise. This is, what, this is what we can be. It goes all the way back to the founding. It's like the founders bequeathed us, bequeathed us a kind of little flickering flame. Sometimes you just felt like it was, it was going to even go out. This little tiny flame that said, we can live together across our differences in a kind of friendship. We can be free people who care for one another. And it was just this little flame because so many people were excluded from its warmth. So many people were outside of its protective circle of light. Right? Only a few people were, were in, in 1787. But by the time Langston Hughes wrote those words in a New York hotel room in 1944, not everybody was in, but more people were in, or at least more people were beginning to be let in. And with each generation, that flame, if we live it right, if we do it right, if we're faithful to what the founders gave us, that flame can grow a little warmer. Its light can extend a little farther. Its protective warmth can embrace more and more of us. And the project never ends because that flame continues to grow. That's our promise. That's what we can be. We can be a free people who care for one another and continue to to make that meaningful, more meaningful, to be more American in each generation. And the beautiful thing about this story, to me the most moving part of it, is that it's not a politically partisan story. Is that a conservative story or a liberal story? I don't know. I don't think it's either one. Because if you're a conservative, and what's really important to you is the, the, the Constitution, the founding, the beauty of, the, of our history, of our lived experiences over the generations, the people who have sacrificed to make America the actual country it is today. If you look back on that history and that legacy and you're proud of it, and it makes you want to sing the Pledge of Allegiance, this is the story. This is your part of your, you're in that story. This is your story. You're part of that story. And if you're on the left, and your North Star is social justice, and what you think is important about America is the possibility of extending justice to, to those to whom it has been denied, to those who have been left out, to those who have been marginalized, if your dream for the country is to broaden that circle of warmth, this is your story. This is what you can believe in. This is who, this, you can see yourself in this story. So if we can, I say, I pontificate, if we can find that kind of common story that lets all of us in, we don't have to see ourselves as people that are divided into groups, into identity groups, whether it be white supremacism or multiculturalism. We don't have to. We don't have to be. Uh, we don't have to define ourselves against others in the society. We can have something. Uh, something that's uh, something that's in common. Something that's shared, notwithstanding. Uh, our differences and notwithstanding this time of testing that we are about to undertake in 2020. I think my friend uh, Charbit said it's going to be a time of reckoning, a time of reckoning in 2020. A time where we're going to see a great increase in rancor, in coarseness, in ugliness of public discussion, uh, in mistrust, in anger, in a sense of heart sickness, a sense of genuine heart sickness. If you think we are seeing it now, I think maybe we should just fasten our seatbelts because it's likely to increase. And so even in a time of reckoning, a time of testing, 
perhaps as much as, it, uh, and there have been a few other periods in our history when we've been tested in this way, but certainly this will be a time of testing. And so that really brings me to the last question I want to uh, put before you, which is, um, what can we do? What can we do to make a better America in 2020? <clears throat> if you'll credit, if you'll entertain the argument that the, the crisis is at least in part a crisis of us, our loss of civic friendship, and if you will credit uh, the argument that we can be a people who care for one another, notwithstanding our differences. We can, be, we can find an identity together as opposed to in conflict with one another. If you'll credit that part of the argument. So what's this last piece? What can we do next year? Because I think I can assure you, or I can at least predict, that, many, that years from now, when we look back on this time, we will want to have asked ourselves, did we do everything we can do? Did we do everything we can do in this time of testing that we are about to undergo as a country? So one answer is to suit up, to fly your flag proudly, to go out there and struggle for your values and your agenda in the political arena, which after all is a series of binary choices. One candidate wins, the other candidate loses. That's how this game is played. 2020 is such a year. Fight for your candidate and your cause and your party. I think all of us are going to do that. Some of us more intensely than others, but this is part of citizenship. But what about this other thing? What about this business of the recovery of civic friendship and the possibility of restoring some level of social trust so that we can find one another again as citizens and as fellow human beings? And what about this part that says that um, that says we can find some things to to work, to work on together because we have a shared identity. What about this belief that even in a time of reckoning such as 2020, our differences do not have to threaten us, our differences can complete us. What if our differences can complete us? And what if it would be important in a time of conflict and rancor to be able without blushing to speak of love in our national life. What about that part of the equation? So, there are many uh, worthy and important activities that you can be involved in to address that part of the equation. But in this wonderful UU environment, I was a part of All Souls Unitarian Congregation in New York City for a couple of years. I know a little bit about this, but I'm going to go evangelical on this here. I'm going to pass the collection plate here. I'm going to ask you directly to join Better Angels. I'm just saying flat out, we want you to join. Um, the country's in a crisis. Uh, we're trying to do something about it. We are uh, not taking any weekends off, and uh, we're real serious about it. As Joe said, we began accepting membership in 2017. We now have uh, more than 8,000 members, actually, Joe, in all 50 states. We have 50 local groups around the country, and they're growing every week. We done many of the kinds of workshops that you all in your alliance have done here and um, yeah I think we're the I think we're the most effective and fastest growing organization in the country that's trying to uh, 
was the beautiful words that were said, not try to change each other's minds about issues, but try to change our minds about one another and see if we can't find some ways to work together and uh, have this sense of hope, even in a period of time where hope is not going to be uh, the most visible part of our national discussion. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm asking you to join. Now, there's a, uh, before you leave, or during the Q&A, we'll put a pass out of, you got the little forms. So, you, so take a form, and uh, a lot of you won't be able to afford this, because it's $12 to be a member. Uh, you know, it's not that much. You can get more if you want, but $12 signs you up, uh, would like you to, like you to join. Uh, so, I'm going to stop here and open it up for your comments and discussions. And remember that our three questions are, um, what's the nature of the crisis? Uh, what kind of people do we want to be? And what can we do in 2020 for a better America? So thank you for listening. Uh, I'm eager to hear what you have to say. Thank you, David, for sharing important insights and providing us with hope and inspiration. These are important antidotes to rampant cynicism and apathy. If you don't know what to do, you can all sit up. If you know, have something to do, you can get out of your apathy. Uh, since civil conversation is our focus, I always suggest that we practice that at this point. I'll share a few guidelines. First, be brief. That's one of the more challenging ones I've discovered in this audience. Only ask one question or raise one concern. And time permitting, after everybody else has a chance, we'll come back to you. Broadly speaking, civil dialogue is about slowing yourself down especially if you feel passionate about the subject that you're about to talk about. So, take a deep breath, slow yourself down, and then think, how am I going to express this with interest, caring, and a dose of humility? Okay. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. At the literature table next door, we have a, a page full of dialogues for guidelines that we have developed over probably the last 20 years. We added a whole bunch after learning some of the better angels techniques. I can also tell you, don't only think about the dialogue as useful to address political <coughs> divisiveness. If you can learn these techniques, it's useful in your day-to-day -day life when you're dealing with those who you love on sensitive issues that you just kind of have not been able to kind of work through. So if you can learn some of these techniques, it can help you every day. But I can also tell you from personal experience that it's not easy. But I can also say the more you work on it, the better you get. So it may start a little bumpy, and if your partner knows that you're trying to do it, hopefully again it will be a teaching moment not a moment to get it over the head. So we have to learn how to listen as well as to speak. Uh, so stick with it. So please now raise your hand. The mic will come to you. We want to make sure that everybody in the room hears what you have to say. Uh, and we have plenty of time. Please. Um, first of all, I, I totally agree with your sentiment that whoever wins, the other side will feel like they've lost. And if we don't come to the conclusion that we have to be together as a, as a community, I get that. But I, I'm feeling that conservative, conservative versus liberal is not what's happening right now because a particular person in the White House who is very divisive and whose um, agenda seems to be to split the, the populace. So I, I don't know quite how to approach people who are um, for this particular individual and be respectful, but 
say this person is really not just a liberal or a conservative, is, is divisive. So I, I don't know what to do with that feeling, and I wonder what you think about it. You're saying that your objections to Trump are kind of pre-political, not his policies, but just how he behaves and how he acts? Yeah, well. Or your, his emphasis on divisiveness? Yes. Yes. Yeah. There are a lot of people on the other side who would say that their objection to the left is its emphasis on divisiveness. So there we go. So you'd have to, each, each side would have to ask questions of clarification about what you mean by that. Another thing I've found is that each side believes they're the one that is being attacked. I found that to be invariably true. <clears throat> I've been on different sides of, a, of an important public issue. I was on both sides of the gay marriage issue <clears throat> and was pretty good, really good friends with people on both sides. I can promise you both sides, each side felt they were the one being threatened. That's true today. Each side tends to believe that they're the ones using fact and reason, whereas the other side is using emotion. Almost everyone on both sides believes that. And on the question of divisiveness, I would say that uh, both sides believe that the other side has done more to cause divisiveness in the country than they have. I, I, I actually think I can report that as just being a flat out fact. And so that puts us in a really hard spot when we uh, talk. Andy Roth in the back there was involved in Better Angels from the very beginning and he'll, re he'll remember this. We got into a big argument at our first convention where each, each side wanted to say that the other side was more responsible for bringing us to this point of, of, of ugliness. And we almost we almost became kind of a stillborn entity over this very issue. And people were incredulous that there would be any way to think of it any differently, right? Who could possibly think that we were the ones causing the divisiveness as a, when these crazy people are doing A and B and C? And both sides thought that with great fervor. So we took the, we took the way out of just ignoring the question and decided that we didn't want to address it, and we didn't. And we just said, we are leaving behind the question of who's more responsible for the divisiveness. And we're simply saying that we are together, from this day forward, going to try to do something good together without asking the other side to enter into an agreement with us that they are particularly responsible for something. other peace building efforts that I've been involved in, you have to look forward and go beyond the hurts in the past and the blame from the past and say, how can we work together? So I think that's the key message there. Of course, I do know that your side was actually more responsible. <laughs> and, we can, and we can talk about that later, sister. <laughs> Given that you've spoken with Trump supporters, can you can you lay out for me what they want for you? <laughs> what they view as Trump? But I, I say that truthfully because I, I have trouble relating to them and I don't know. So what what is it that they like about this man and why do they want him to win in 2020? You know, I don't think I have any special insights to that question. Um, I'll just say that based on my experience with Better Angels, that you would get a lot of different answers to the question. One answer that you get often is, we don't particularly like the guy, but he's better than the uh, than Hillary Clinton because she is basically of Satan. 
and so that anything would be better than that, and so therefore, even such a flawed person as Trump. Another person would say, well, even if we don't like him personally, his policies on the whole are better than the opponent's policies, and it would be that his policies and general values are good for the country. A third answer would be that he is particularly reliable on one or two issues that really, really matter to us, such as uh, right to life and uh, uh, Supreme Court appointees. Um, a th another answer would be, uh, it ain't pretty, but the establishment needed to be broken up, and he is gleefully breaking up a corrupt establishment, and we could not be after. Could he work harder to blow up the establishment? Because the establishment is exactly what we hate most, because they have had nothing but contempt for us my whole life. Nothing but contempt for us my whole life. And so as quickly as these people can be displaced and rudely evicted from their power positions, that is exactly what I want to see. And Trump is exactly the kind of guy I think is uh, capable of doing it. And there are a lot of people who think that. A lot of people who think that. So um, I'm sure I'm not getting it right. You know what I mean? I, I'm just kind of repeating things I've heard. So. Uh, again, I'll add another thing that if you join Better Angels, you'll learn this. Um, part of it is getting past stereotypes. As we've had dialogue, we've discovered there's a huge difference of opinion on most everything. And that's a good thing. Don't assume the other person believes X because they... Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I'll just say, Jeff, you reminded me, I mean, you're, you're, you've probably been to a Better Angels thing more recently than I have. Well, one of the great things about this is that I was telling my friend, uh, my friend in the sweater there, uh, things that each side believes about the other. Each side believes that the other side's opinions are more or less homogeneous and that they all march in lockstep, whereas we are disorganized and, and all messed up and aren't really prepared to be coherent, our side. Each side firmly believes that that's the case. Hi, David. Hey, Andy. So uh, when you bring up the question of what country do we want to be, I think there's a, uh, a fundamental difference out there. Because on the left, um, people are more uh, leaning into e pluribus unum and uh, a nation of immigrants you know, the Statue of Liberty welcoming the immigrants, a melting pot. And then some people on the right, not all people on the right, but a certain minority, I think, or certain segments anyway, feel that this is a white Christian country. So to me, that seems like a big rift and a, and a, mm -hmm. you know, a strong one, one that has a lot of energy to it. I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. That is a deep cleavage. And getting deeper, right? Getting deeper. Uh, look, there's two ways to think about these other people. These people that white, Christian, etc. One is that they're just so wrong that they have to be, that their views have to be defeated and they have to be kind of either made ashamed of them so they won't say it or they have to convert to having a different point of view. Another view is that we have to share this land with them and that we should try to be, we should try to uh, act in a spirit at least of, of some kind of conciliation. I'm with the latter opinion. Many on the progressive left are of a different opinion, but that's my opinion. Um, I was a community organizer for a number of years. I believe that situation precedes bigotry. I think the situation one is in in one's life precedes bigotry. And so uh, I think you could take a lot of people 
perfectly decent people, perfectly kind people, and put them in one situation and bigotry would emerge, and you put them in another situation, same people identically, and cooperation would emerge. So that's what I mean by situation precedes bigotry. And so I'm not willing to label half of the country as white supremacist or racist or anything like that. Uh, I know that there are ugly strains in our society and, um, and they shouldn't be swept under the rug, but I, um, I don't, I don't, uh, it's a little bit like who's the most divisive, right? Who's the most dug in on an ugly identity expression? Uh, who's the worst? <clears throat> I don't want to play that game. Can you offer any suggestions on how an individual level to deal with someone, frequently someone you've known for a long time, maybe you've worked with them, maybe they're your neighbor, uh, maybe your relative, you know, etc., who has ideas totally opposed to your own, but who you as an individual have respected and would like to engage some way as to not come to blows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a hard one. I suspect everybody, well, I don't know, but I suspect many people in the room have had an experience like this at Thanksgiving dinner with crazy Uncle Joe who won't <laughs> shut up about whatever he won't shut up about or whatever it is. It's a friend, it's a relative, a child, a brother who lives in some faraway state who says things and you go, what? 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 Or, some, or someone that you respect, like you, like you said. Less, <coughs> use this serious question. Um, not to be glib, but we do have a, a little activity in Better Angels called a skills workshop where you learn little techniques of conversation, um, that will help, it's designed to help people navigate and even sometimes initiate successfully those kinds of conversations. An example would be to make the uh, distinction between a question of clarification and a gotcha question. A question of clarification is when I'm trying to draw you out about your opinion in a sincere way. A gotcha question is when you smuggle the accusation into your question. So, if I'm dealing with some guy or some woman who I think is some racist, white supremacist, tending person, I might say, tell me something in your own life, some, something in your own experiences that has led you to have the kind of views you have. That would be a question of clarification. A gotcha question would be, well, you say you're not prejudiced, but you just voted for the most prejudiced candidate in American political history. How can you square those two things? That's a gotcha question. You've smuggled the accusation into the question. And I can promise you that if you ask that kind of question, you're almost certain to get a recoil because people feel rightly, they feel that they're being attacked. And so they don't, they don't, uh, they don't uh, soften up and, want to hug you. They don't want to give you a hug when you ask them that kind of question. Mm -hmm. no, so there's some other things that, that people have learned uh, who teach these kind of things at Better Angels. I mean, uh, one, uh, one thing is to avoid uh, truth statements and to give something that just says, here's what, I'm, what I think or here's my opinion. An example of a truth statement would be climate change will be destroying huge chunks of Earth within 50 years. That's a truth statement. An example of a here's what I'm worried about statement would be, I'm really concerned that if we don't address the issue of climate change, it will really harm our environment terribly. This is a real worry I have based on what I know. 
that's a, that's a here's what I think question, which is a more invitational question because it invites the other person then to share with you what they think rather than to try to rebut your truth assertion. Like if only they could just get their heads wrapped around the simple facts, then they would understand it. Well, guess what? They won't understand it if that's the way it's said to them. So there's some more, you know, but, they, but on the other hand, I don't mean to be smug. This is hard business. I have uh, friends and relatives who, who I just sometimes just, uh, you know, really have a hard time with on this exact same issue. The other thing you have to realize, even if you're trying to be conciliatory in the conversation, doesn't mean they are. Maybe they haven't read the booklet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have just like one comment out of my 5,000 <laughs> kind of questions. Um, I saw a movie the other night, Robert. Husband and I saw a movie the other night that was mind blowing. I did send the information out to people at the Mammoth Center, and it's called The Best of Enemies. Have you seen that? Yeah. yeah. Oh my God! It's about this is based on the um, integration of schools in Charlotte, North Carolina. In, oh, in Durham. <laughs> and he's from North Carolina. That's right. Um, from Durham, North Carolina. And it was a, um, a, a story, true story, about a, um, an African American woman and a Ku Klux Klan member, and the um, extreme differences, of course, that they had, and how they reconciled, how they actually—it it, it was just—it was such a great uh, preparation for coming here. Um, but anyway, how did they? What happened? What was the nature of the reconciliation? Ooh, they worked, worked real hard. I mean, there was incredible community organization. People came and helped the community. This was a, a long, long thing. One thing was that the um, the yeah, yeah, that, that that's a whole story. One thing was that the um. After the Ku Klux Klan, the member of the Ku Klux Klan, had a son who was in a hospital, let's say very sick, and the woman, this was after they had like their sticks out of all this hate, the um, African American woman, who had been growing a little bit more able to see him as a human being, went and arranged some help for the son. The son. And so things softened, and then they softened, and that was one thing. People, they, they softened. But yeah. the way, they, it's very impressive, like, you know, that would take a lot. It's very impressive that the community organization part of it. What's the name of that? Charette. Charette. Do you know the word charette? Um, he, they created a charette, and um, similar to Better Angels, and people were put together. That's people, terrific. And that's a true story in our country. I, I, it's another example to me of the maxim that situation precedes bigotry. Yes. They were in a different structural situation. Absolutely. They had a community of a certain nature, and it predisposed them to be able to find the better angels within. It did, exactly. Yeah. I was just going to ask a question over the last number of years. I just wonder how do we begin to surmount the polarization when Christian values over uh, whether someone can make a birthday cake because someone is getting married at gay, when tearing down a Confederate monument to people who may have honored Robert E. Lee versus racism, when our politicians up in the Senate or House and the executive are fighting publicly and it's all being put, reported in the media. How do we begin to, I mean, where do we begin to try to get out of this web of organization? Thanks. Uh, well, we, we, 
ask ourselves that, you know, the beginning of Better Angels, and we decided we would take the approach of first looking at ourselves and trying to just citizen to citizen, you know. So we would just meet, we, that, that's still mainly what we do. We just meet at a kind of citizen to citizen basis and try to find one another again as friends at that level. Um, but as we grow in numbers, we would like to influence our institutions. We would like to influence our leaders. That wouldn't it be nice to have a Congress that worked again? Wouldn't it be nice to have uh, a media environment that was not uh, as uh, toxic uh, as it is now? Uh, wouldn't it be nice if liberal kids at conservative Christian schools weren't afraid of speaking up? And, wouldn't it be nice if conservative kids at elite liberal schools weren't afraid of speaking up, which is really, in both cases, true now. So it would be great to affect our institutions and to have a, the, the virtuous cycle that you want is changing people, people who are able to effectuate this change within influence our institutions, and then the institutions in turn cause more individual change. So you have this cycle uh, that we are uh, aiming for, beginning with the citizen to citizen. But we're still small, you know, we've only been doing this for a year or so, we have 8,000 members. We probably need a million members to be as big as, we want to be as big as the Sierra Club or the NRA, and um, so, but well, that's our goal. That's our goal. So, but you said, how do you begin? I think how you begin is with you and a few other people face to face, and then it goes out from there. Uh, some good things came out of that that led them to stay in touch and it led to some interesting uh, people working together uh, in several of our states. In Ohio, where Better Angels was born in Southwest Ohio, uh, the leaders of the county Democratic Party who were, you know, progressive, you know, they either voted for Bernie or Hillary in the last election, strong, you know, strong liberal people. And the, uh, again, the Tea Party founders, who were very strong in that county, have come up with a, uh, a proposal to reduce the influence of large contributions in politics. And that, so both the very progressive people and the Tea Party people, both of whom mistrust bigness in a way, big donors, dark money, that kind of thing. Both, they have that, they have a, it was funny, they, they almost, they don't use the same words, but it's the same idea. The people, because of their wealth, should not be able to run our political lives behind closed doors. And so they have something called no, no money, no, I forget, it's a, they have a campaign. And they've started at the county level. And it's, it's, it's people that were, you know, bled for Bernie and people who uh, founded the Tea Party. You wouldn't think, but they really are doing this. And then in a couple of other uh, locations, they formed uh, what we call Better Angels Policy Groups, where 50% red, 50% blue, we're now working on common policy proposals. The only one that's come to fruition so far is this money and politics one. But we're hoping that some others will emerge too. It's hard to do, you know, but that is at least two examples where something constructive has happened. And, and our aspiration is to do, you know, our aspiration is to move from the citizen to citizen depolarization to institutional change. So, I'd like to add an observation from our alliance. Um, when we talked about guns, as for instance, there was pretty mutual agreement on the statement of the problem. Too many people in America are getting killed by guns. So once you get to that point, creativity can happen and ideas can emerge and not left or right. And if you can mobilize that, 
you've got really something going because then you can have a, two sides going to their elected yeah. officials and saying, we figured something out. Please listen. Yeah. We have joint delegations that do visit their local Congress people. Mm -hmm. And we've tried to have bipartisan town halls mm -hmm. where people from both sides come to hear one member of Congress. And we've also had situations where both candidates running, the Republican and the Democrat, appear jointly at a town hall with better angels to not just shout at each other. It seems like um, social media has set up some echo chambers that have added to the polarization. Certainly it's opened up channels to have people outside the country, other countries, just intentionally try to spread uh, divisiveness within our country. Uh, do you see any way that social media can be used uh, to overcome uh, polarization, can be used to overcome divisiveness? Let me ask you, this is not a gotcha question. I'm, I'm sincere. Do you have any thoughts on that subject? Boys, I'm telling you, man, I don't really. Do you have any thoughts about how we could do anything? Uh, no, personally, I mean, it's been great for me to, you know, to reconnect with friends in Jackson, yeah. Mississippi, and Georgia, and places like that, and to share things with my family. But I'm just sort of tempted to, when I see these things um, that I just find so objectionable, I just ignore them or unfriend people. So I guess I've added to that just by staying within my own echo chamber and trying, you know, not to get my blood pressure up when I see these other yeah. things. So, no, sorry, yeah. I don't have any help. I was hoping you would. Yeah, I do have one. Why don't this, this lady seem like she has an idea? <laughs> Um, in, in response to your three questions and the mission not just of the angels but of your general local groups wherever you come from you guys are missing the point and the politics is part of social being it's re like our religions are part of social being it's part of the human factor so it's, it's separate but it's not really separate what you're looking at is 400 years of America. This year is the 400th year, 1619, of the first slave ship coming to America. I'm the only person here with some African descent in me. And I, I'm gonna have to call an elephant, but it is what it is, because that's what I do, being a Jackson, Mississippi myself. Uh, you can't. <laughs> Are you from Jackson? No. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, we have to call the elephant in the room out. Racism. Our social society, our health care system, our politics, our business in America is built on racism. All of you in here have had the wonderful luxury of privilege. He said the operative word. When he's tired of it, he's fed up with it, he turns it off, he blocks it out. Somebody like me, I can't block it out. It's 24 7. But what do you make of that? In other it's, words, you said we're all missing the point. What's the point we're missing? The point that missing is this is not a new phenomenon. What's this? This is the polarization. The polarization has always been here, but because you can turn it off, block it out, didn't have to deal with it in your silos, to you, you think it's new. <laughs> My people always been here with this. This is not new. We're, and history also repeats itself. We're like a post-reconstruction. The 1870s, the late 1870s, the KKK was developed and devised because those people are taking our jobs. Those people are doing, taking our stuff, blah, 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 blah. We're repeating what has been America. And the racism, the bigotry, the divisiveness is so ingrained in our social factor that when you raise it up, you get called racist to your folks that you sit, Uncle Crazy Uncle Joe in the, in the basement that you only let out on Thanksgiving. He creates a whole where it says crazy things that you don't want to hear. It's been here. Does, well, one way to work at it is one by one, awareness. Start by increasing the diversity here in the room. That's it. Start there. Number two, social media 
is not causing the divisiveness. Social media is only exposing what my people have known for 400 years. And some of y'all here just figured it out. It's not, what I use it for is a tool for creating awareness. Because you may not well know what you say or do contributes to the polarization, contributes to the implicit bias, the assumptions that you have about people, places, and things. Just being aware, and you do it one like the angels, one by one. Then it spreads because diseases spread. Diseases of acceptance spread. And then people become aware. Because, and I have some friends who were kind of off on the kooky right side of things. Then they started realizing, maybe I had a problem. Now they are coming around and understanding. Um, some of the folks on the far, far left, I say need some medication sometimes because it's so bizarre that it got, kind of gets crazy. But we, I, I think in, in the whole summation of what we're talking about here, that is where we have to start, one by one, realizing how you affect the divisiveness and the things that you can begin to say, think, and do otherwise to change it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the heartfelt statement. I want to say a, a word of where I agree with you and a word of where I disagree. Uh, where I agree with you is the deep reality of racism in American society from the beginning. And You know, as a Mississippian, I, you know, I, I saw it every day. I didn't have to be there. I didn't have to be in Mississippi, but I'm just saying I, I did see it. So I, I, uh, I agree with that part of it. I'll tell you where I don't agree. I don't agree that everyone else has missed the point and that only you have gotten it. And uh, I don't agree that everything that we've been talking about has to just be kind of turned into this question of race. And I don't agree that um, the, the problem, uh, the job of white people is to acknowledge racial guilt and the job of black people is to get white people to do that. I don't, I don't believe those things. And um, uh, so I think the basic concept I have of people talking to one another is that everybody's got something to learn and everybody's got something to give. And it can't be a situation where one side is just doing the instructions and the other side is giving, receiving. So I, I, that's why I was responding a little negatively. You said, you're all missing the point. Let me explain to you I'm black. I got the point. Well, no, it's just generalization. Yeah, OK, I mean. Because for the most part, most people here, just in this room, yeah. But when you go across the street, outside down the street. I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. Just by the being. I just think what I what I value is like real conversation at yes. this point. Yes. I don't I don't value I just value real, real you know. So I, I thank you for what you said. Yeah, I was here first. Who else? Hello. Uh, I I think you touched upon the point that we talked about. You got politicians from both sides to appear together in a, a town hall meeting. I was wondering, I, you also said that you don't believe people in Washington are going to do it. But have you tried it and failed at it? Or that's just your gut feeling? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? No. <laughs> he said, <laughs> He said, well, you said the people in Washington won't listen, they're not interested, have you asked them? Or is it just based on your gut feeling? It's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, gut feeling. <laughs> okay, 
All right, I, I take your point. I really do take your point. What we should do is do that. Now, we are beginning to do that. We have had members of Congress come to us. We've had three members of Congress come to us recently and say, will you do Better Angels programs for our staff? Mm -hmm. And we're going to do that. We've had uh, mayors, uh, a mayor's association. So what I really like about your question is I was kind of demonizing a little bit in my statement, and you called me out on it, so <laughs> I appreciate that. No, you're right, right? They're not something, they're not aliens, they're just people, people. So we should go to them and make our case. No, you're right, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I am part of the Do we call ourselves the Monmouth County Group? And I appreciate the opportunity to meet with people who have different views than I do. And I think to this woman's point, the fact that we live, I mean, I, I attend this congregation and Many of the people I see in the room right now are from this congregation, and we, we have to actively reach out and find other people to have conversations with. In Asbury Park nearby here, there are several churches that invite people like me to come and have conversations with African Americans, and it's been a very rewarding experience for me. And, um, so I'm wondering if you have suggestions for how we can reach out and have more opportunities to get out of our <coughs> silos. Yeah. Yeah, did everybody hear that? Yeah. Uh, the lady said uh, she's been a part of discussions that have been beneficial to her where she gets out of her, you know, sort of silo or her group and how can there be more opportunities to do that? And it gets back to what my friend said here about uh, racial diversity in, in certain settings, you know? And um, what I, I would be interested in what other people think about this. I don't know what your experience has been around the racial diversity question, but I have found that these things have to be done on the basis of equal power. In other words, if I'm a part of a group that's already set and established and has its identity. And I say, oh, would you like to come join us, you other kind of person? Yeah. Wouldn't that be great for you and us? We all mix and mingle and enjoy each other's foods and so on? Uh-uh, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, doesn't work. Uh, because people, uh, uh, it's like people don't feel comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what does work sometimes, is when it begins on a basis of actual equality, where the people starting the effort, paying for the effort, leading the effort, conceiving of the effort, are themselves representative of the diversity you're looking for, and have leadership positions in the community. So if you just say, uh, oh, we're a bunch of conservatives, and we would like some liberals, so we're just going to get some person who says they're a liberal and invite them. Oh, so we have a liberal. No, 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 no. The person has to be a credible leader, have followers. And then they have to say, I'm in this, and I'm saying to my followers, this is okay. So we've struggled with this a lot in Better Angels. So because if it's just a group of people, they're saying, we've had three meetings, and now we'd like to diversify. What usually almost never works. It has to be from the get-go, which is much harder and sometimes causes you to have to go a lot slower than you otherwise would. I, I don't know if that helps, but, I, well, and I don't even know if that's exactly the right answer, but I've seen more success at Better Angels when we do it that way than any other way. So, yeah. yeah. I have three more questions here. This is good. This is the most important part of our stuff. So keep, keep it up. Uh, thank you. Um, exactly. 
it's obvious. In, in light of what uh, like this lady has yeah, raised, I agree. Diversity is the beginning of, of uh, agreement, or, or at least uh, seeing the other. Conservative. Seeing yourself in yeah. the other. I'd like, to, I'd like to say it that way. With science. And that's what we hear in a lot of the churches and, so, and, and spiritual groups, I'll call them, that are attached to any particular. Yeah. And uh, Gina and I have attended many of those. And the beauty about it is we look, that we look, we try to look real sincerely past the color, past the age, past the, the, uh, the seeming differences that we see and see the true person underneath. And that's really a spiritual thing. Now, may I ask the makeup of your 50 initial groups across the whole country uh, in terms of race, uh, background, religious background, perhaps age, age. Do you have young people? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> So I think it's easier to answer each question. Okay, just quickly, uh, Dorothy Day had a big influence on me. She comes from a Catholic tradition, and she used to say, my goal is to see Jesus in every human face. It's kind of nice, right? It's kind of what you were saying. You see the humanity of the other. Uh, in Better Angels, we do pretty good on red-blue parody. Uh, we tend to more upscale people educationally and economically, which is a big problem for us. We are not, we do not have the, our African American membership does not reflect the, the portion of African Americans in the country. We're not horrible, but I'd give us a C minus on race. Uh, I'd give us a D on <coughs> economic diversity and educational diversity. I'd give us a B plus on political ideology parity. Mm -hmm. We are very aware of our, oh, and on US by age, we do very well among younger people and very well among retirees. What we don't do so well at is that middle-aged child-rearing group. They're too busy going to school plays or something. I don't know, but but we, we need to fix. We we know we we see all those things as weaknesses. Our our ambition. We say that our goal is to reflect reflect the country, to look like the country, and we have not achieved that. But where it's our objective. Geographically, we're pretty good. All 50 states. Oh, wow. Yeah. regard of better angels. Uh, I don't know whether or not we have people, uh, native people who are members or not, but I suspect, you know, I suspect we failed. Uh, so you, you, I, you've made a very good point. I, I, I uh, I don't mean to make, I don't mean to go in a lighter direction or a different direction, but I do want to relate a story that happened recently that perhaps touches a little bit on the theme. I don't know what your, I don't know what anybody's opinion about this, but the word that is most commonly used or extremely commonly used when people talk about polarization today is tribalism. That's the word that, that a lot, you just hear this a lot. And uh, we stopped, we stopped using it a while back because um, several people uh, 
several Native people told us that, uh, well, as people who actually are members of tribes, they didn't particularly appreciate having everybody use that word to describe something terrible. Um, and uh, this seemed, once we heard it, it seemed so obviously true that we stopped using the word tribalism. So um, uh, I do think it would be good, a tiny, tiny little thing, maybe symbolic more than anything else, but I do think that when we talk about polarization, not using the word tribalism might be, I think it would be, you know, wise. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to sequence. Yeah. Well, I say how many questions, it seems like people are getting more comfortable, which is a good thing. Uh, so raise your hand if you don't want to ask a question. We'll see. Please. Raise your hand. Yeah, raise your hand. One, two. So we, can, we can do it. We can do those four. Okay. I'm not going to ask. Um, I want to say that I think I was sitting here most of the meeting thinking, feeling along the lines of what Teresa said. And I wish I had expressed it the way you did. I really appreciate um, the way you, you said it. Um, because in, that is the, the foundation. Um, when, um, David, when you said that there's a, an inequality issue that we need to uh, relate to, it's the equality of the human soul, which Frank mentioned, that we are well, as one soul in many bodies. That's the foundational quality that each one of us can do. We don't have to wait right. for a group to develop. But on that same tone, I, I would like to offer as a member of the Baha'i faith community to look to the Baha'i community all over the world. We're doing this work, we've been doing it. Yeah. And um, that's what I would like to share. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, uh, when I was 15 years old in Jackson, Mississippi, and the schools were uh, uh, being desegregated for the first time, uh, there was something that was a transformative experience in my life and the life of many other young people in Jackson, where we had these uh, gatherings where the black and white students would come together, usually for the first time in their lives in any situation, because the segregation, the Jim Crow laws were very, very strict. And, um, and it turned out that people, uh, 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 members of the Baha'i community were the ones that organized it. And there were like four in Mississippi. You know, like four, there was like a, six Unitarians and four Baha'is and the rest black, black Baptists and white Baptists, you know. But they were the ones that organized this thing and it really had a transformative experience on me. On me. It was really a beautiful thing and I've been grateful ever since. So. Oh, sorry, where's my... Yeah. 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 I suppose this is a kind of a, of a witness, but I have just been amazed over the uh, last year at to, uh, uh, out of what I've, I've, done, I've made some effort to look at the other side. And uh, myself, I'm a really proponent of, of gun control, so I decided to read the book that's rather authoritative for those on uh, who favor uh, free arms. I forget the fellow's first name, but his last name is Lot. And, uh, and what was amazing to me was to see the, the abuse that they were feeling and he was feeling and the people which was exactly mirroring the abuse that those of us on the side that I happen to be on is feeling. Yeah. And uh, that was a really eye-opener. Uh, and I think we, we're stuck, on the, you know, whichever side we, we maybe end up on, is that we're in a kind of mental segregation. Uh, we think we got the way it is, but it's, everybody else must be inferior because they don't obviously they don't see it. So anyway, I just want to say, so I'm so enthusiastic for that reason about the uh, work yeah. of Better Angels. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for those comments. I appreciate them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have a few more. Well, I, well, there. 
So let, let us be brief as we're running out of time. I'll increase the length of my answers. <laughs> Earlier, a question was raised about what can we do about Sir, social media. Sir, hold it like this. Earlier, a question was raised about what can we do about social media. And I know a lot of people become overwhelmed with social media. We're either inundated with social media or we see social media that we don't like, but we don't really know what to do about it. But there are actually some very practical things you can do about interacting with social media to combat harmful, abusive, negative, or false social media. And as we move forward towards the election next year, it's very important for anyone who is troubled by social media or by seeing false social media, there are some very, just a few practical things you can do. For example, the, the principal social media, which is Facebook and Twitter in this country, both have a mechanism for a tweet or a Facebook post which you believe to be either inaccurate, false, misleading, or harmful, or potentially even uh, encouraging someone to cause self-harm or harm to others. And that is if you click on the post or the tweet, you have the option of reporting it to Facebook or Twitter and saying that this post is harmful or it's false or it's misleading. And they give you a whole bunch of different options. And so, if you, and I do this, so if you see something, you can report it to Facebook or Twitter and they will supposedly investigate it. What I said with the 400 years was the time that the first slave ship came to the Americas. Okay? I am also a native woman, Cherokee Choctaw. I'm a multi ethnic person. In America, though, I have a darker complexion, so my Mississippi Choctaws wouldn't accept my families because they intermarried and intermingled with the Africans. So just want to just clarify what that was. Thank you. And that, that's a topic that should be put on for another event because yeah. that is a history that is never school. We don't look like the cowboys, the Indians and cowboys in the movies. Good. That's good. <laughs> Could I have one? Yeah. yeah. I have another question. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, civility is probably a necessary condition for progress in the direction that you're talking about. I'm not sure it is sufficient. Okay. okay. So let me think about the direction since we're talking about what could be done. Uh, I'm coming from engineering background and I was trying to see perhaps I can put uh, applied in this area and I haven't done it so I like your thoughts on it. In any invention that you see uh, there's always a contradiction or a conflict. Like you want the aircraft to be light, but you want it to be strong. So they create a conflict and contradiction. And there are techniques of how to go about addressing those issues, systematically doing it. And I would have to say that the Russians invented that systematic technique of doing it. And uh, so now we're talking about, let's say, uh, the immigration. In immigration, yes, immigration has a benefit, but also can have a drawback. Because it's taking away jobs from some people who have different kind of skills, but it's adding to the wealth of people. So that is a contradiction. You can say, let's do a compromise. That's kind of a thing which I was hearing. Compromise is, uh, in my opinion, a cop-out. You have to see what can we do so we get a win-win on both sides? Both sides can win. And there are certain, uh, tech, uh, certain solutions that come up, and there's a method for analyzing these problems. So perhaps we might want to think of those methods. So cross-pollination between engineering and social sciences. Thank you for those comments. Uh, yeah, very good. And I would like to, I would like to do what you say. A philosopher that influenced me a lot is a guy named Isaiah Berlin, and he said that most things in life 
Most conflicts in life do not consist of good versus bad. They consist of good versus good. Two good things, like the aircraft situation you talked about. And uh, some other philosophers I admire have said that the, the uh, compromise is an intermediate way of solving the problem. The highest way of solving the problem is to um, resolve it at a higher level where both sides can see themselves in the solution, but it's not a split the middle compromise, it's a reframing at a higher level. Very easy, it's easier said than done. Uh, but the great social movements of our time have, have I think, tried to do that. Okay. Yeah, well, well, I also think that uh, systematic methods of doing it in engineering, I would like to see if it can be transformed into social science. Thank you. Okay, I think we are setting a record on the discussion period. Uh, I think we'll make this the last one. Hello. I'm just saying, you said this, uh, uh, this election time should not be thinking, should be thinking not emotions. I'm first generation immigrant. Whatever I saw, Bushes came, then oh, President Obama came. He stirred us in something in me. Something in us, I think, everybody, white, black, or brown. So there has to be something about emotions. I feel very much, of course, then I said, Obama became president. This country can do anything. Then I thought Hillary might win. So whatever Trump has done, it has brought the worst. So I watch so much television now. I'm retired pediatrician. All day, I'm, Trump is on my head. So I want to get rid of it. Somebody should come from the other side who can also touch our emotions. Then maybe we might, whatever, agree with the other side. But Trump has done some damage. I don't know what, but I just feel part of that, a victim in a way. Is the, is the audience willing to go over time a few minutes to allow the last few questions? Okay, great. Thank you for your, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, let, let her be, let her be the Say a little louder this time. Oh, well, I can't repeat it. I think I can, I can repeat it. Okay. Thank so, you. She, so I think it's appropriate that the last question yeah. came from the Chada family. Yes. As, as Stevie mentioned, as we convene later, you can continue the conversation, including with David, if you really want to pigeonhole him on what you want to say. So yeah. that's fine. I thank you for your question. And what, the, what my friend said was that uh, if the idea was to not feel strongly emotional about the election, that she really couldn't do that because as an immigrant, she felt very provoked uh, uh, by President Trump and very emotionally, you know, had strong emotional feelings about it and that she was watching the news a lot now because of this. And, where would be the emotional response of someone on the other side, and, but also in general, I think you were speaking about the inevitability of bringing one's emotions to, to, a, to a situation of this nature. And I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's inevitable, it's natural, it's human. We all do it. And if we have been particularly touched personally by something, we, we, we can't pretend that we are not bringing our feelings to it. And um, in fact, the re recent psycho psychological uh, studies on the subject have, have suggested that we largely base our political views not on abstract reasoning, but on our intuitive feelings about a situation. We react intuitively. If someone is disrespectful to us, if someone seems hateful to us, we don't have to hear what the person is saying. We don't have to read a position paper. We have an intuitive feeling about it, and then later on, we develop an intellectual. Uh, so I, I, I think you're making a very, a, a very, a very good point. And um, no, the problem is not the problem is the, the emotion is not the problem. Uh, the problem is lack of engagement. The problem is a lack of engagement. Um, and unfortunately, I would suggest that you're not likely to get it on television. <laughs> you know, you're likely only to get it in um, 
face-to-face -face communication uh, with people who are not, do not share your views. I've done that too. <laughs> yes, yes, sure, sure. Thank you so much, all of you. Really So during the community room, you can get a copy of that, or as you leave. So we have a, a token of appreciation for David's great work. It's a customized folder, which is blue on one side and red on the other. And I'll show it to you this way. <laughs> just to not just right. play it straight and, down the middle. And red and blue together is not purple. Red and, red and blue is red and blue. And it stays that way. You got that. A little humor is also important in this process. So, thank you so much, all of you. So get that piece of paper, join Better Angels. So I need a minute of your time. So, first, thank you to the, the UU for allowing us to be here. Thank the Mana Center. Thank the Shanti team that made work light for all of us. Um, special thanks for the China family for their participation certainly for their funding of the program. And mostly thank you to the audience. I would say from a dialogue point of view, this was probably the, the deepest and the longest. And the questions were great. And the questions were challenging. And that's what we want. So a few things. If you're interested in kind of going a little further, consider uh, joining the Central Mammoth Better Angels Alliance. If you want to do that, fill out an index card on the literature table in the other room, provide your name, phone number, and you have to say whether you lean left or right, you're conservative or liberal, use whatever lingo you like, we'll figure it out, because we have to maintain balance within the organization. And we might have an opening now so there's an opportunity, or you may be called in the, in the future. Did y'all remind me to go in there? I think